Yes, I can. All right, good. So first of all, uh, what we should understand about literary analysis is two main things, basically. Um, and that is that a literary analysis is an interpretation and an argument. And a lot of times when we do literary analysis, when students are first tasked with a paper like this, your first focus mm -hmm. is on the story itself or the poem itself and what it says and what's happening and who does what. But a literary analysis is not an all about type of paper. It's a, an analysis, which is a breaking down of what it means, why it matters, what, is, what does it prove? And so the literary analysis paper is really an interpretation, which is what you think it means, and an argument where you present, here's what I think it means and here's why, right? So your goal is to prove that your interpretation of the text is true. And when we say is true, we basically mean that you can prove it, that you can show good evidence for it being true. Um, and of course, there are different perspectives and there's different ways to look at it and different ways to interpret. So you're just putting forth one particular way to think about a text. Okay, so sometimes students are like, okay, what is there to argue about? It's the story is what it is, right? And so some of the things you want to think about as you do a literary analysis is how and why it was written. These are you know, some of the questions that you want to think about is um, what the author, why the author makes particular choices to, to uh, with the characters, with the setting, with the story. It's not just what, but it's the why that you're trying to identify or that you're setting up an argument for. Here's why the author does this, or here's why the character does this, or here's what, uh, why this matters or, or how it matters. Um, so what we're talking about is what we call close reading. <clears throat> and a close reading is a thoughtful, critical analysis of a text that focuses on the significant details. So again, you're not just telling the story, but you're looking at particular aspects of the story to talk about or to focus on, particularly looking for patterns that may be important um, in understanding what is going on. And in and, and this deep, it, it, it's a deep understanding of the text in terms of its form, the craft and the meaning. And so that sometimes is the challenge because you're like, well, the story it just is and the characters just do, but you gotta look at it again and say, well, why do they do that? What do I notice in terms of the patterns? Because writers, authors often embed um, details that are important and that are meaningful. And so our job is to try to see what those things might mean. So you wanna notice features um, and language that is used and think about why. Uh, they might be used or what effect they have. Even if you don't know, you can't get into the mind of the author necessarily, but you can interpret what effect those things have, how they lead you to believe one thing or another. Um, so when you do an analysis, some of the things that you might do is compare co particular components within one story. So compare, and we'll look at some of those components in just a bit. Um, so within one story, you may look at how one thing or another works together in order to accomplish something or to have a particular effect. Or you may look at a particular component of, of one story and, and see whether that component is present in another and, and look at how those things um, are similar or different and what effects they may have. Um, you might even look at how concepts and forms relate to larger aesthetic or political, social, economic, religious uh, concerns. And, and what, what the type of reading that that is um, would be to look at what's going on in a story and to think about why that matters outside of the story as it relates to what was going on in the political world um, or, or how we might connect it to, to something uh, in, our, in the political or social um, or even religious context, you know, how a lot of times students will, will do the religious reading of a text and say, you know, the use of light in this story proves that, and you may, you know, tie it to something um, religious. So any one of these ways to think about what's going on in a text can be a literary analysis paper. And you would just pick uh, which one seems to be most interesting or relevant, depending on the work that you're studying. Um, 
the argument, as I said before, is what the literary analysis is all about, will focus on, as I said before, specific attributes of the text, such as character, setting, tone, imagery. And you should think about how the author uses those elements to create certain effects. I said that. Um, the argument will make specific arguable point about those attributes. So again, the literary analysis is not an all about essay. It's not all about the story. Instead, it's all about a specific aspect of the story, a specific attribute that is present throughout or in some key points. Um, the argument will point out the author's choices and attempt to explain their significance. So again, you're not trying to get into the mind of the author because you can't, but you're interpreting what you believe he or she is, is trying to do in the, in the work. Okay, so we're gonna, I kind of went through the premise or the, the basic structure of a literary analysis. And then I, I wanna share this little video that kind of restates in a, in a creative way what I said a moment ago. And let me make sure I am sharing my sound. Well, let me know if you're able to hear it and then I'll, I'll know. I think I, I selected sound. Let's break down the literary analysis essay. Okay. The purpose of the literary analysis essay is to analyze or break down some aspect of a work of literature. You might ask yourself something like, how is irony used to create suspense in the text? Or how does figurative language create the mood of the text? For a literary analysis essay, you might also compare and contrast two characters in the text or examine how the conflicts in the text reveal the theme. Those are just some examples of literary analysis topics and ideas. You can also look at how a text reveals a certain time period in history or a certain culture's beliefs. A literary analysis essay reveals your ability to understand and reveal the deeper meanings of a work of literature. View the example thesis statement below. This essay topic would ask the writer to determine the similarities and differences between two characters in Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare. Notice what the thesis includes. As seen in the example, the thesis statements for a literary analysis essay must include the title, author, and idea of the essay. Read through the example thesis statements below and notice how they all break down some aspect of the text. It's not playing. We can only hear it. Yeah, we can. Okay, only that's hear weird. It. Let me stop and reshare. Um, hmm. Can you see this, the video now? Let's see. Is that better? Okay. The purpose of the literary analysis essay is to analyze or break down some aspect of a work of literature. You might ask yourself something like, how is irony used to create suspense in the text? Or, how does figurative language create the mood of the text? For a literary analysis essay, you might also compare and contrast two characters in the text, or examine how the conflicts in the text reveal the theme. Those are just some examples of literary analysis topics and ideas. You can also look at how a text reveals a certain time period in history or a certain culture's beliefs. A literary analysis essay reveals your ability to understand and reveal the deeper meanings of a work of literature. View the example thesis statement below. This essay topic 
would ask the writer to determine the similarities and differences between two characters in Romeo and Juliet by William Shakespeare. Notice what the thesis includes. As seen in the example, the thesis statements for a literary analysis essay must include the title, author, and idea of the essay. Read through the example thesis statements below and notice how they all break down some aspect of the text. Also notice that they include the title, author, and main idea that will occur in the essay. I'm going to pause it so we can look at these. In The Most Dangerous Game by Richard Connell, the various types of conflicts within the story work together to create suspense. In The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald, the use of symbolism re reveals the true desires of the various characters. I would probably want a student to say which characters, but the imagery and figurative language of Shall I Compare Thee to a Summer's Day by William Shakespeare reveals the theme of love. So notice the components that are in each of these. You're identifying the work, you're identifying some aspect of the work, and you're saying what it, why it matters, right? They work together to create suspense. They reveal the true desires of the characters. They reveal the theme of love. And so then the paper has to prove that to be true, that these things exist and that they are working to accomplish what you say they do in the text. And so it's really important to pay attention to the, what they're showing us here in as far as uh, what makes a good thesis statement for a literary analysis. Make sure to give evidence to support your claims. Ask yourself what information can you find in the text that shows some aspect of Romeo's and Paris' personalities are similar and different. For example, you can think about how they are similar and different in how they treat others or how they show love. You can also look at how the characters act. It is up to you to find evidence from the text to support your claims. Look at the brainstorm ideas below and notice the different ways you can prove Paris and Romeo are similar and different in the text. Remember that you must include specific cited evidence copied directly from the text. These must be followed by in-text citations. View the example evidence below and notice how they support the claims and include in-text citations. Make sure to keep your tone formal and academic. You want to make sure that you do not use slang or first or second person personal pronouns. This means no using I, me, my, we, us, our, etc. This is not a personal response. View the organization for literary analysis essay below. The introduction is the first paragraph. This will introduce your topic for the reader. Make sure to end this introduction paragraph with a thesis statement. The body paragraphs develop your ideas in the thesis and you end with a conclusion paragraph. Let's review the literary analysis essay. The goal is to break down some aspect of the text to show deep understanding. Make sure that you are familiar with the basic structure. Also, keep your tone formal and rely on specific evidence from the text to support your claims. You are officially ready to analyze. Okay. So, uh, oops, let me get back to where we were. Okay, so we looked at some examples in the video of what a thesis statement might uh, might look like, a good thesis statement for a literary analysis. And we talked about what the components should be. What, what, are you, what do you understand about what a thesis should have um, for a literary analysis paper? You um, 
a thesis to include the title of the author, the idea of the essay, and yeah. And, and the idea of the essay. Okay. Yes. The okay. Title. The title. Mm -hmm. um, so what about this thesis statement? What's missing? The author. Okay. Yeah. Some people might think this, but also we don't have a complete uh, thesis for a literary analysis. It's not gonna go very far if you start there. Um, or even this, this thesis was, which is not really a thesis, it's just a, I'm gonna tell you what Moby Dick is all about kind of thesis, right? Um, now this one says a little more, of course, it doesn't include the name of the author and title, which is what's missing. But if it had the author and title, what is different about this thesis statement compared to the others? It's more developed. Yes. What does more, it include? More developed and more specific. Yes. So specific remember, evidence. Mm -hmm. Right. So remember earlier when I said that we're looking at an aspect of the story to argue, right? You're interpreting it and then you're arguing it. So the first three statements are not going to get us there. To say that Moby Dick is the problem of evil is very vague. To say it's boring and pointless, not much to argue there. <laughs> to say it's about a big white whale is only going to lead us to talk more about what happens with the big white whale in the story. But to say that the use of whiteness, and you notice that that's in quotes, so that means that term is something significant and key, it's coming from somewhere, um, illustrates this uncertainty of the meaning of life that Ishmael expresses. Now we're making an argument we're saying that there's this thing called whiteness, which now we'll need to explain in the rest of the paper, and that that thing that exists there is there to illustrate something that is this uncertainty of the meaning of life. And so that now we have to prove something. We have something to prove in the rest of the paper, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. Yes, Joyce Presley, I see your hand. And you're muted, by the way, so you're gonna have to unmute. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I just wanted to check on one thing. Mm -hmm. um, I joined the session and I know that you're talking about literary analysis, but you're not, you, when you're using that phrase, you are separating that from literature review, correct? Absolutely, it is a completely okay, different good. thing. I just wanted to make sure yes. that, um, because I've been working with students on yes. literature reviews, Yes. And when you're in the social sciences, it's sort mm -hmm. of understanding that difference is so important. Yes, Thank and you. I have a presentation where I, I make that distinction, um, but we actually did the presentation last week on what is a lit review. Um, and okay. so because we, we made two distinctly different presentations, I didn't go into, you know, the difference at the beginning of this one. But yes, last week we talked about how to do a write a literature review, which is an entirely different thing. And today we are speaking specifically about literary analysis. And I know that okay. that sometimes trips students up because of the word literature. Right. Um, in our okay. workshop last week, if you want to direct students to it, it's um, on our YouTube page, on our website as well. If you go there uh, mm -hmm. under our resources and student tutorials, we have uh, links to the steps that you take for, for literature review. And, and then, of course, literary analysis being something different. So for the sake of, of just making sure we're clear when we talk about a literature review the literature in that context has to do with all the things that have been written about a particular topic that you are going to look at in order to argue or to do research or to look at what matters in a particular field of study um, and of course for a literary analysis we're speaking specifically of literary texts therefore we're, that's why we're focusing on texts such as um, poems and stories and, and that sort of thing. Um, so thus the example of Moby Dick, because that's a literary text. 
and and some of us who are taking world lit classes maybe some of your english courses require you to look at particular texts and and do an analysis of them uh, literary analysis that's that's what we're we're focusing on today now when of course as i began the presentation today i was saying though because literary analysis is focused on a literary work, a poem, a story, a short story, a novel, what have you. A lot of times the temptation is to just talk about the story and what happens in the story and who does what. But as I said at the beginning, the goal is not to, even when we're doing literary analysis, the goal is not just to talk about the story, but it is also to, it is more importantly, it is about proving something is true in the story and that's why we need to have evidence and support and the evidence will come from the actual examples in the text itself what happens that proves what it is that i say uh, is going on and then also we might look at um, what others have said what others have argued as a way to sort of uh, think about what we are interpreting and consider how it compares to how others have interpreted it Mm -hmm. um, what is the difference between a book review of a novel and a literary analysis? So they're, they're similar, certainly, mm -hmm. a book review versus a literary analysis. However, I feel like it's the purpose of, of the book review versus the purpose of a literary analysis that makes the difference. So a, a book review has more to do with why I like this book, why you should read this book, right? If I'm doing a book, you know, movie review, why you should watch this movie. And, and they may do an analysis, you know, and show theme or, or talk about how, you know, the significance of the characters and so forth. But the purpose of it is more so, this is why you should or shouldn't, you know, engage with this work, because that's typically where reviews live. They live out there where, you know, people will come across and decide whether they, they like that text mm -hmm. and want to do something with it. Whereas a literary analysis in and of itself is the deep study of a work in order to identify some specific meaning. And typically when we think of literary analysis, it's within the context of the conversation about that work where others are also thinking about those things and we're responding to, that's why, you know, when we think about doing a, a literary analysis and drawing on what other critics have said, it's sort of that the analysis that we do is in conversation with those other analyses that exist about that text as well. So literary analysis, pure and simple, is one that is more of an academic activity within academic context, uh, whereas a book review might be seen more as something that we would produce for a wider audience, for a public audience that's, that you know, we're trying to sell them on the idea of taking a look at this particular work. Thank you. Yeah, sure. All right, let's see if I can get my slide to advance. There we go. Um, so the other thing that you might use as evidence and support for a particular thesis would be the historical and social context. I think I mentioned that before. These are all the different things that you would, would use as evidence in support of a thesis. And it just depends on what that thesis is as to which of those will be most relevant for you. Um, now, when we're using sources, when we're, when we're incorporating what others have said about a text, uh, we should be sure to show how their thesis thesis relates to ours. A lot of times when we when students start doing research and incorporating outside sources, they relinquish their ideas and thoughts about the text and they just go, oh, what he said and what she said. And we get these nice long quotes from these beautiful uh, sources that we have found in our databases. And the writer is just like, yep, right? And so the, what we wanna make sure we do is begin first with our own reading of the text and our own interpretation of it and what we think it means and why it matters, what we notice, and then compare what we think about it to what others have said about it. They, the sources that we find should be adding to our knowledge and to be, should be adding to our understanding. And then we can decide whether we agree or not. And so the sources that we find that have written about the text are not necessarily right, it's just a different view. 
and and so as a, as a writer of a literary analysis you own the, your interpretation and so you have to show your audience how it is true why it is true and compare and contrast what you're noticing um, and then whatever the source whatever source you have found that that adds new information or makes you think of it a different way you bring that in and decide how, what it helps you to know or how it helps to further your your point so for example to integrate a source you always want to frame it you don't want to just drop a quote in and move on you should be telling us well this person says this you know johnson argues that the whale and moby dick is symbolic of uh, you know, whatever it is symbolic of. Although there is evidence to support this interpretation, this is you talking now, the writer, what Johnson overlooks is the way whiteness comes up again and again. Let's say that was your thesis about whiteness. So if Johnson is saying something about the symbolism, the question for you in your writing is, how does that compare to the argument that you're making? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Is he saying something different? And so you always want to frame whatever, uh, whatever you bring in from somewhere else, because at the end of the day, it's your argument and your analysis. So I've talked about what we sometimes fall into the trap of when it comes to writing about a literary work. And one of the big ones is just telling us all about the literary work. So we need to make sure we're understanding the difference between summary and analysis. Of course, the two work together. You do have to have some summary in a literary analysis but make sure we know what we mean by summary. A summary identifies the what, what happens. Analysis focuses on the how and the why. So the balance between summary and analysis might is more of a 90-10 a uh, ratio. So 10% summary, 90% analysis. Tell us what's happening, but spend more time telling us why that matters. Okay, so summary refers to the process of condensing someone else's work, specifically the main ideas in your own words and doing justice to the author's original intentions. Summary answers the question who, what, when, where, why, and how, and your summary should only be long enough to encompass the main ideas or the main narrative, you know, what overall is going on in the story if you're focusing on a, on a story. Um, and then of course it, this, it's not about your opinion, you're just stating this is what happens. One way to, uh, and this kind of is a good tip for whatever summary you are writing, whether it's for literary analysis or not, uh, one way to, to approach a summary is to highlight the key words that you see as the main idea, um, and then interpret those key words and write from that interpretation. What is your understanding of those key words that, that jump out at you from the original? Um, and then summarize that in your own way, what it means, and, and you're in, good in a good position to do a, a good summary, an actual summary. So I wanna look at two examples, one of a summary and then one of an analysis so we can kind of see the difference. Uh, what we're looking at here is an example of a summary. There's no argument. There's no conclusion. It's a statement of what is. The Wright Brothers Airplane Company Museum is a lively aviation museum full of images of early planes and the history of the Wright Brothers. The museum is a virtual museum existing solely online. Visitors to the museum can read how the Wright Brothers began as bicycle repairmen before becoming interested in building an airplane. Visitors can also get blueprints and instructions to build their own rubber band powered model Wright flyer. The museum is a great resource for learning not just about the Wright brothers themselves, but also about the history of flight and understanding how flight is accomplished. Who, what, when, where, why, and how, right? That's the summary. It's just telling you what is. But if we're going to do an analysis, analysis features original thought from you. It examines the deeper meaning and includes what is not limited to the work's purpose, theme, and figurative language. And we're gonna look at some of that in a minute. Analysis answers um, 
how and or why the theme or patterns are important or relevant. Uh, lets you make your own conclusions about how those uh, how the elements of a topic, theory, issue, or story fit together to create something that may not be evident at first glance. And that's the reason why you have to prove it. It's not obvious. Your goal is to prove your thesis or argument about the work and not just tell what it is about or even what others say. So to do an analysis, you want to begin by choosing the elements or areas of your topic that you will analyze. So assuming we're looking at some story, um, determine what you want to focus on. Do you want to focus on the characters, something about the conflict, the setting, or the plot? Um, whatever element you choose, you want to focus on that and reread it. So we might read the first go round just to know what the story is about, but then go back and say, okay, I want to pay attention, closer attention to this particular element, and I'm going to take note of what goes on with that. Um, you want to ask why and how about the thing that you're focusing on. How does this element affect the other pieces? Why is this element effective or ineffective? How does this element contribute to the overall meaning? So when we talk about the element, we're talking about either the character or the conflict or the setting or the plot, the language, there's other things that, that might count as what you want to focus on, but whatever that is, is what you pay attention to. And then, and then draw a conclusion based on what you notice about that particular element, about what goes on with that character, uh, what does that mean? Draw your own conclusion about why that, what you think uh, is going on with that particular element. So if we were to look at the same passage about the Wright Brothers Airplane Company Museum as an analysis, what you'll notice is that there's an actual argument and there's a specific element or area that is chosen to study. Now, interestingly enough, this is not a literary text. This is an analysis of a museum, but you can see how it still works. So the argument is that the Wright Brothers Airplane Company Museum of Pioneer Aviation is an example of the retelling of history that uses an ideology to create a public American identity. The ideology is uh, this work ethic and character for realizing dreams. So the writer here is taking uh, a stance and saying, what's going, not just what's in the museum, but what, what that is doing. And he, and he or she is saying it's a retelling of history that is focused on this particular ideology of work ethic and character. Now, what happens next is there has to be demonstration that that is true. What do we find in this museum that proves this work ethic ideology? Um, first, we have to understand what the ide ideology is. So the writer says the ideology promotes the belief that success can be achieved by anyone, regardless of their circumstance, provided they display the behaviors of hard work, curiosity, determination, enthusiasm, and courage. The museum does this by replacing the story of that historical day at Kitty Hawk that the public is well, well aware of with the story of how it was the right character that led them to reaching their dream. So now we're, we're doing an analysis of what exists in order to prove what this author has interpreted as true. The museum shows that the Wrights were not highly educated, were only able to reach their goal of control of flight because of their work and care, ethic and character. The museum uses the words, now it's telling us how. They make a claim and they're showing us how. They're using examples from what they find in the museum to prove what they've just said is true. So they say that the museum uses words of courage, dedication, enthusiasm, discipline, curiosity, and gumption when describing the Wright's identities. And then the writer says, by creating this identity of ordinary people who were able to achieve greatness because of character and will, the museum aims to impact visitors to the museum to adopt the same behaviors. So that's a claim, that's an argument that this writer is making and hoping you'll accept as true based on the evidence that they have provided in this paragraph. If the museum is able to persuade visitors to buy into this ideology and exhibit these same behaviors themselves, this can work to relate an overall productive society for America. So this is another claim that the writer is making. So you can see the difference, hopefully, between the two. The summary is just saying what is in the museum, and the analysis is saying what the, the museum's, what it contains, and what it means or what it's doing, what it's, why it's significant, why it matters. So I wanna just go over some of the things that you might look for 
to analyze in a literary text. We have the seven elements of fiction, which is which are character, that is the person in a play, novel, or movie, the plot, that's the sequence of events that happen. The setting, of course, is where it takes place. The point of view is my, you know, from first person or second person or third person point of view. The theme, that is the underlying message, the sort of what's the main point of it all. And there might be multiple themes. One, one story may, may, you may be able to draw, um, make an argument for, their, for any number of themes. And so you just pick one. And when we think about themes, again, we're thinking about the overall um, point of the text. And, and we can talk about what some of those might be. You might also look at uh, style, that is the writer's voice or use of diction and syntax. Um, or the use of particular literary devices. So if we understand what a simile is, a metaphor, personification, symbolism, alliteration, hyperbole, figurative language, any of these uh, would be considered literary devices that you might look at closely how they are used in a story and what they are used to do. Um, so some examples of figurative language are metaphor and simile. So when a metaphor is when you contrast two seemingly unlike things to enhance the meaning or situation. Um, and so, for example, if you were to say, you are the sunshine of my life, that's a metaphor. It's saying that one thing is the other. And that's different from a simile, which uses like or as, because it says one thing is like another. And so these, this use of language uh, to compare unlike things is significant because it has some meaning. And so this might be something that you would look at in a literary text to say, what does it mean that one thing is compared to another or is said to be another, which is to, that it has all of its essence in some way. Um, and what does that lead us to conclude? Um, then there's hyperbole, which is exaggeration. Personification is giving a non-human object a human characteristic. So any one of these could be looked at in a story or in a poem. And the question would be asked, well, what, what effect does that have to use that kind of language? An easy one to identify, particularly in a story, is the character. So if you wanted to focus on a particular character, the question would be, what does this person do um, that is significant to the story? Uh, there are different characters, though, and so the character that you focus on might be the protagonist, which is the character that the story revolves around, or it might be the antagonist, which is the character or force that opposes the main character. Um, and then there might be minor characters, or there often are minor, minor characters that may be significant or important in some way. And if you're doing an analysis, it might be a good idea to look at a minor character or even the antagonist rather than the main character because there might be something to, to, to bring to light that is not immediately obvious. Whereas the main character is kind of, everyone's focused on that person or that thing. Um, if you were to do an analysis, you might wanna look at something that is not so main, um, it's not so um, prominent because it, you may find things that would not ob be obviously recognizable. A dynamic char character is a character that changes in some important way. A static character is one that remains the same. <clears throat> Typically, these are background characters, but sometimes they can they have a particular role that you may identify as you study a text. And then characterization is, is what we call the author's choice to reveal a character's something about a character, whether it's their personality or their appearance or their motivation. And uh, if you're studying a character in a literary text, what you would probably be looking for are what is it that we're able to know about this character based on what the author gives us, based on what the author reveals through the character's behavior or personality or some, you know, twitch or, um, you know, unique thing that the, the character does or says. When we talk about plot, we're talking about the arrangement of ideas and or incidents that make up the story. That might include foreshadowing, suspense, conflict. Um, exposition is the background information that we get before 
the story really begins. Um, there's rising action. That's the where you know everything builds to a to a climax. There might be a significant turning point in the story, which is called the crisis, and it determines how things will end. And then, of course, the resolution that follows from that. And so, again, these are all things that might you might focus on if you're doing literary analysis. You know, what does that mean? What does it mean that it ends that way? What what you know? What does it reveal about the character that he or she does a particular thing in that moment of crisis? Um, so. Also, there's the setting. Sometimes we ignore the setting, the backdrop, but it definitely in, influences the um, significance and the importance of what's taking place. And so you might look at how a setting, how the setting has, what effect it has. You know, what difference does it make if it's a dark and gloomy night versus if it's a bright and sunny day, right? Those things matter in interpreting everything else that goes on. And so an example of uh, looking at setting is in this thesis statement where it says, in Poe's The Fall of the House of Usher, the crumbling old mansion reflects the decaying state of both the family and the narrator's mind. So that's an example of looking at the setting of a story and making the argument that it has something to do with what's going on with the characters as well. All right, the point of view that the story is told from can be important. If the narrator is telling a first person story, how is that different from if the narrator is a second person narrator or, or an omniscient narrator? So the second, if you think about a first person narrator, he or she will only know what we are able to know as we go through the world, right? And so his or her interpretation of what's happening with the other characters may be limited and, and we may be able to make an argument that they, the first, the character, um, the first person narrator was wrong in his or her, you know, assumptions or conclusions or actions um, or not. Whereas an omniscient narrator who's able to be in the mind of all the characters um, certainly changes what we're able to know about what's going on and, and what we may be able to argue or not about what is true. As I mentioned before, theme is also a, a, another element that is often focused on for literary analysis. Um, and it's the main point. It's what does it all mean? What is it all about? Um, and often we want to think about like the universal sort of nature of things and condition of being human. So death and dying, perseverance, importance of family, benefit of work, power of love. These are sort of universal themes. And then the question would be, well, how is this theme of love or death and dying treated in a particular work? Um, and so you would seek to answer that question in your analysis. Um, every author will have a unique style and use of language, and sometimes that can be something to focus on, uh, how they use language, what uh, repetition exists. Um, these things all have an effect, and they're all for purpose. And so looking at the style of a work, whether it's written in a colloquial language, um, can, can be important or significant to your interpretation of what is important. So those are the, all of the elements that you might think about as you do a literary analysis. Um, are there any questions before I go to our last slide? I know that Forrest said that she had to write a literary analysis, so you can let me know if you have any questions as you think about what you're gonna do in your assignment or for your assignment. What we have on the page here are the references for further information. Um, you can certainly look these things up and, and get, go back to any of the points that I, that I touched on. Um, before I let everyone go, I wanna let you know that we are really, very excited to be hosting one of our student authors. She has written a children's book and we'll be doing a, a signing on Thursday here in the Writing Center at 1230. Very proud of Trinity. And 
um, she's going to be reading from her book. So if you're able to stop by, we'd love for you to come. And then next week, our workshop will be about citing our favorite subject. <laughs> no one's favorite subject. Well, teachers, yeah, all the professors are like, yay. Um, students hate it, but we're gonna we're gonna try to delve into what we mean by citing, how to cite, and uh, all the particulars. Now, uh, I will say that even though we'll be talking about citing, we are not going to be able in an hour to cover all the different ways to cite all the different types of sources, but really our goal will be to help you understand the difference between di the you know different ways to cite and how to find the answer to your particular question about how do I cite this particular type of source. Um, also, we talk about the fact that citing is not just the in-text or the work cited or reference page, but it's all of those things working together. So hope you will join us. All right, thank you guys. If there aren't any questions, I wish you all a beautiful rest of the day and week.